Take your Bibles this morning, will you, and turn with me to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 12. As you know, at least for some of the sermons um, throughout this summer, we've been looking at questions that you put in the uh, suggestion box for sermons. And uh, I've taken a while before I've uh, decided to, to do this one. But uh, finally this week, it just really struck me that this is the time to do it. And the question was this, the Jews don't accept Christ as the Messiah, so how come they are still called God's chosen people? 
The Jews don't accept Christ as their Messiah, so how come they are still called God's chosen people? That's a very good question. And I know some of you are thinking, like I did at first, well, that's just because they are. Um, but I think there's a lot more to it than that, and there's a lot more that we need to look at in the scriptures with regard to that. First of all, when, when God gave Abraham the promise that he would make of him a great nation, and then all the blessings that are, that are included in that promise, is that a conditional promise or is it unconditional? Sometimes, sometimes it's uh, added, added to it are the words, if. I will do this if. I will do this if. Other times, there's no conditions added to it at all. It's unconditional. So it's a, it's a really big question. I know where I'm going with this. I'm probably not going to tell you right at the start where I'm going with this, because I want you to look at the scriptures with me. But I've decided that this is not a, a, a question that can be answered with one verse in the Bible or with one sermon. Uh, there's a lot of questions that are a part of this. For, for example, does Israel still have chosen nation status with God? What, was God's covenant with Abraham conditional or unconditional? Has Israel lost her favored nation status because of her rejection of the Messiah? Is God done with Israel? Does God have any future plans for Jerusalem? Now, I will give you my answer ahead of time. My answer is he does. But I want you to openly look at the scriptures with me to discover what the answer is, because this is a, this is a very important question. There are big ramifications of it. For example, how do we pray with regard to Israel? Can we still pray for the peace of Jerusalem? I found it interesting, one of the times that we had missionary conference in Nebraska, I had an alliance missionary to the Arabs, and I had an alliance missionary to Israelites, to the Israelite people. And it was really interesting to listen to them bat back and forth just what's going on in Israel. Who's, who's at fault in what's going on? Does God still have a future plan for Israel? Did you know that uh, just within the last couple of days, I just heard it on the news this morning, that there are some pranksters who in Rome have been writing graffiti on walls around Rome uh, with swastikas saying the end of the Jews is near. Just today. Just today I heard that. So I want to go back to the beginning, not all the way to the first chapter of Genesis, but I want to go back to the beginning of God's dealing with the nation of Israel and the formation of that nation, and it's found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, and that's as far as we're going to go today. We'll look at uh, more of it in the future, but will you open your Bibles? Uh, I'm not going to have it on the screen, I don't think. I didn't ask for it to be put on the screen, so I want you to have your Bibles open to the 12th chapter of Genesis. The Lord had said to Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Let me pray before we start. Father, thank you for this passage. Thank you that it is so contemporary. Thank you that I believe you still do have a future plan for the Jewish nation. And I pray that you would help us as we look through your word and that each of us would dig deep uh, in your word. And we may, we may say that you do have a plan, but no, not have any idea why we say that. Maybe it's just because we've been taught that in the past. But I pray that you would, uh, you would help us as we look at your word to be open. And I pray that you would give us clear minds and open hearts to what it is that you want to say to us, to us as Gentiles, out of uh, these words that we look at today and how you make them so relevant to us in the day in which we live. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. 
I want to look with you this morning at the elements of God's promise to Abraham given in the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis. And the first element is divine initiative, divine initiative. The question might be asked, how did Abraham find God? There, there was really no reason that he should. He lived in Ur of the Chaldees. He lived between the Tigris and the Euphrates. He lived in the area that creation really all began. Uh, he was surrounded by other nations that were godless. Um, how did he find God? I think the only answer to that is that God found him. And if you think about it, that's the only answer to how you found God. God found you. God found you. He loved you before you even knew him. He can't be reached by human effort. Job had the question, can a man by searching find out God? The answer is a rhetorical answer, no. Man cannot find God of his own initiative. God takes the first step. The creator of the universe is the one who reaches down and reaches out to us. Nine times in Abraham's life, he either, either heard God's audible voice or saw an appearance of God in a theophany or a Christophany. Theophany, appearance of God, Christophany, an Old Testament appearance of Christ. James Strahan, in a book that talks about Hebrew ideals in the Old Testament, says that revelation not the book of Revelation, but the whole theology of Revelation, is the direct influence of God on the souls of men, which teaches them the truth in moral and spiritual things. Revelation is God reaching out to us. During communion, in just a little bit, I'm going to ask you uh, to think about how God reached out to you. How many of you came to know Christ when you were just a child? How many, how many came to know Christ in your uh, teen years or in your 20s? How many of you came to know Christ uh, like later years, 30s and beyond? Sometimes when we're little, when we're real young, we don't realize that it's Christ, that it's God who's calling us to himself. We have to, we see that a little bit more clearly when we get older, when we're converted, when we're older. But none of us would be Christians were it not for the fact that God called us. He, he said, Phil, Tom, Joyce, Sandy, come to me. Come to me. He beckoned us. He wooed us. Just like a lover woos the one he loves. The history of redemption, like creation, starts with God. God created us, and he's the one who draws us to himself. Now, I don't know how that all happens. I don't, I don't go for the, the hyper-dispensational view that says God chose some and he rejected others. God chose some to go to heaven and he chose some to go to hell. I, I think we exaggerate the words election and predestination and, and just take all of the human will out of it. But I do know that God loved me before I loved him. And I do know that God loves you. We see in this with God reaching out to Abraham in the midst of a human, humanistic, uh, idolatrous, horrible, uh, lack of knowledge of God nation in the midst of all kinds of other nations that are the same way. We see God reaching out and calling out Abraham. It's divine initiation. It's determined by God. Five times in these first three verses, it says, I will, I will, I will. God, God willed it. Secondly, I see separation. The first word of God's call, look at it in verse 1 of chapter 12. The Lord said, had said to Abraham, what's the first word? Are you all here? Leave. Leave. 
leave. Leave what? Leave your country, leave your people, leave your father's household. Commitment to God always involves separation from some things. Commitment to God, salvation to God, always involves us separating ourselves from something. I've got a quote that I put up on the screen so that you can see it as well as hear it. Again, from James Strahan in, in Jewish Hebrew ideals of the Old Testament. As every man enters through the gate of life alone and will depart through the gate of death alone, so in the decisive spiritual crises of life, every man, every woman is alone. We must repent and believe alone. He must give account of himself to God alone. So long as a man shields himself behind others, loses his individuality among the many, God's work cannot be done in his soul. It is when he isolates himself and lets God speak directly to him as if there were no other person in the world that the truth finds him. We all found God alone. You may say, well, I found him in a crowd. I found him in, in, in the Billy Graham, one of the big Billy Graham crusades, and there were several thousand people who came forward. You found him alone. He, he, called, you, he called you all by yourself, and you didn't go forward just because there were a bunch of other people going forward. You went forward because God was tugging at your heart. God tucked at my heart when I was just a little lad, somewhere between... I, I, I had to be around five years old. My folks had just moved from Chicago into the new house that they had built in Elmhurst, Illinois. I don't know how long we lived there, but one morning when I was home with, with mom, I wasn't in school yet, and I felt God tugging at my heart. Don't ask me all the implications of it. I can't understand all that happened. All I knew is that God told me that I was a sinner and that I needed Jesus. And mom sat down by my side, knelt down by my side uh, at my at my bed and, and we prayed and I invited Jesus into my heart. And about five years later, my brother, who then was five years old, he and I were sitting out on the back deck behind our house, just a brick patio really. And for some reason, I don't remember all that I shared, but I talked with my brother about what it meant to be a Christian and God called my brother Bill. And Bill prayed to receive Christ. A few years later, three, four houses down the street, I remember sitting on the steps going up to the second level of a pretty big house that my friend uh, Roger um, Langell, I think was his name, lived in. And I remember sitting on the steps, I remember it like it's today, talking to him about Jesus. And Roger, to, to my knowledge, to this day, never responded. But God called you. You didn't dream it up in your own head. He called you. And, and that call separates you and, and, and isolates you to a certain degree to dedication to follow Jesus. The call of Abraham is the nearest thing in the Old Testament that we have to the New Testament call of Jesus when he said to his disciples, come and follow me. Leave, leave all the other stuff behind. Just come and follow me. There is, there is separation. John chapter 17, verse 14, Jesus said, we are not of this world. He calls us into a different world. He calls us into his kingdom. Separation is too often associated with certain, a certain list of taboos. Oh, I'm, not a, I, I'm a Christian. I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't do the other thing. That's fine. I've got my list too. But what, what it really means, it's much more comprehensive than I don't do this and I don't do that. It's my lifestyle is different. God calls me to a different lifestyle. He calls me to a radical lifestyle. He calls me to transformational living. He calls me to a new way of thinking and a new orientation and a new mindset. There's a separation involved. Thirdly, there's guidance involved. Look at it in verse 1. Go to the land that I will show you. Now, I know I've spoken sometimes as if Abraham had no clue as to where he was going. 
That's not really very accurate. He did know that he was going to Canaan. If you want to look for, for it yourself, in chapter 11, verse 31, and in chapter 12, verse 5, it says that he knew the ultimate destination of this journey he was going on. But he didn't know the way he would go. He didn't know all that would transpire between here and there. He knew it in general, but he didn't know it in particular. Faith in God, faith in Christ is sure of our final destination. If you are a believer, you know that you're going to heaven, right? But you don't know when you're going. You don't know exactly how you're going to get there. You don't know how many roundabouts you're going to go through by the time you get there. You don't know how many dead ends you're going to hit. You don't know how many delays. You don't know how many wilderness wanderings. You don't know how many. It's, it's a long path, and sometimes it's very circumvented. It is not just a straight line. It's very, very roundabout. But he promises his guidance. I got to thinking about this this week, and I, I thought, you know, we always talk about life being um, the, the Bible being a map and that God kind of gives us a map so that we know our way to our final destination being heaven. I think it's more like a GPS system. I, I don't think he gives us the whole map. I think it's out there and heaven's there and I think we get the map via a GPS really one day, maybe one moment at a time. That's just how it goes. It's always been that way. That's what God does with us. I felt a call to ministry when I was in junior high, to pastoral ministry. I laid awake sometimes thinking about preaching. Why in the world a 12-year-old would lay in bed looking up at the bunk of the bed above me thinking about being a preacher? I don't know because I couldn't talk to anybody without crying. I'd get in front of a church bunch and I'd just start blubbering because I just... But I sort of felt that way. But it was a journey. I didn't know when I got into college, I was a pretty decent trumpet player. And I thought, you know, maybe I'd go into music and this, that, and the other thing. I went to a, went to a missions trip in Ecuador, South America. And on the way home, I was reading an article in a magazine. And God used that kind of unrelated article in the magazine to say, I want you, I want you to not be a trumpet player for a career. And, and I don't necessarily want you to be a missionary overseas. I want you to be a pastor in the States. I didn't hear an audible voice. But I, I knew God was talking to me. He, he leads us a day at a time. A day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Goes one of the old hymns. He guides us day by day. One of the poets wrote, Keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene. One step enough for me. There's an interesting exchange between Moses and God when Moses is going up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 33. It's sort of a rehashing of what had already taken place. And it says this, The Lord replied, My presence will go with you. This is God speaking to Moses. My presence will, will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, listen to this, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else what else will distinguish me and your people from all the other peoples on the face of the earth? What distinguishes us as believers is the same thing that distinguished Moses and the people of Israel from all the surrounding nations. God was with them, and they were with God. And even when they weren't with God, God was with them. That is the distinguishing mark of a Christian. God is with you. God is with you. It's not that you go to the Alliance Church. It's not that you don't smoke and don't chew and don't go with girls who do. 
It's not that you don't do this and don't do that. It's not that you keep a strict devotional life. It's not that you are nice to your neighbors. It's not the key distinguishing mark of the people of God is that God is with us. He is with us. Fourthly, he gives to them a blessing. This is another distinguishing um, mark of, of these of this blessing. He says, I will make you into a great nation. I will make you into a great nation. It didn't open overnight, it didn't happen overnight. There were a lot of setbacks. There was all kinds of wanderings. There were all kinds of detours. There was all kinds of disobedience. God didn't make Israel into a great nation overnight. It took a long, long time. One of the commentators that I read said it this way, especially with regard to the son that God promised to Abraham who would make the nation great. He says this, the promise of a son dominates chapters 12 through 20 by its tantalizing delay. The promise of God giving Abraham a son and of that coming to fruition is the dominant theme of chapters 12 through 20 in this book of Genesis. And it's, it's tantalizing delay until Abraham and his wife Sarah were old people. I mean old people before the tr truth, before Isaac was actually born. I will, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. By the way, I will make you into a great nation. Um, one of the verses that came to mind when I was studying this was the one in the New Testament where Paul says to the Philippians when he writes to them in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. Next Sunday, as Ryan already announced, um, I've asked uh, Lucas Jorgensen and Canyon Hoheisel and Zach Horish, because all of them are sensing God leading them into full-time vocational Christian ministry. Uh, they've been away from us for a while. They pop back in now and then because they're away at college, but they're going to share their testimonies, each one of them. It's, that's the service, along with uh, the worship music. But I, I want them to share with you how God has has led them. He's not going to make them into a great nation, but he, but he is leading them one day at a time. God promised his blessing to Abraham. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great. Look through the book of Genesis and into the New Testament, and you discover that God gives to Abraham the name of prophet, prince of God, servant of God, father of many nations, and father of all who believe in the book of Romans. I can't, if you've got your Bibles, please turn back to chapter 11, because I can't, I can't go on without contrasting that with what took place when, when they built the, the Tower of Babel, these kings these uh, renegade, uh, tyrannical kings build this tire, Tower of Babel, thinking that they're going to reach, reach heaven on their own. Chapter 11, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and, and settled there. They said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. You know, the tower fell and God crushed their ambitions and their pride. And I can't help but think that in chapter 12, when God says to Abraham, I will make of you a great nation, I will bless you, and I will make your name great, that God is contrasting what took place with the Tower of Babel. Here God gives to one man a great name. Out of that, I think, 
it's better to have God give you a great name than to try to make a name for yourself. Number five, the fifth element, responsibility. Verse two, and you will be a blessing. It really has sort of a purpose idea behind it, so that you will be a blessing. Abraham was not just chosen for blessing, but he was chosen to be a blessing. Abraham some, had some responsibility for the outcome of this whole thing. He, he couldn't just sit back and say, oh, I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. There are many of you, all of us here, who are, who are greatly blessed. God has helped you. God has blessed you in many ways. And he doesn't bless us so that we will hoard our blessings. He blesses us so that we will be a blessing to others. I'd like you to repeat after me these words. Let me say them first, and then let's say them together. I am blessed to be a blessing. Say that with me. I am blessed to be a blessing. Again, I am blessed to be a blessing. You're blessed to be a blessing to your kids, to your spouse, to your neighbors, to your relatives, to your enemies. You are blessed, and I am blessed to be a blessing. Sixthly, he offers them his protection. Here in verse 3, it says, I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. God has allowed the Jewish people throughout the ages to go through some very difficult circumstances, but he has always demonstrated in the end that he loves them dearly, and he has restored them, and he has protected them. They have faced, and I'll share this in one of the future sermons, they have faced more persecution, more difficulty, more more threats of extinction than any race on the face of the earth. And yet God has always brought them back. And he'll do it again. He'll do it again. And lastly, worldwide blessing. He says in verse 3, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. You could also read that, so that all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. How? Through the coming of Messiah, through the coming of Jesus, through the Abrahamic line, through the coming of Jesus to be the Savior of the world. Now, I want to apply this to you and to me. So if you've got a pencil, take it out. If you want to write something down, write it down. If you've got a fabulous memory and you just want to remember one thing, uh, then just sit there and remember one thing. If you don't want to remember anything, then just sit there. Tune me out. What does all this have to do with me and you? First of all, God makes the first move. He initiates. He pursues. He brings us to himself. He chose you before you chose him. He calls you. He calls you to do certain things. He calls you away from certain things. Just like he's calling Zach and Lucas and uh, Canyon to possibly go into full-time vocational Christian ministry, he may be calling you to be an administrator of something. He may call you to be a teacher. He may call you to be a homemaker. He may call you to be a doctor. But take enough time to be solitary and to be quiet so that you know that the path you are taking is the path that God wants you on. He's calling you. He calls you most to himself. But he does have things for you to do. 
And as you listen to him day by day, he will make that clear. He makes the first move. Secondly, the distinguishing mark of a Christian is that God is with you and that you are with him. Christianity is a relationship with God. There's a verse in the Old Testament, I think it's in the book of either Hosea or Amos, where it says, can two walk together unless they be agreed? As you take hold of God's hand and he takes hold of yours, you, you walk together and day by day, step by step, hand in hand, you go in the same direction and you have the same heart. Thirdly, don't worry about making a name for yourself. Don't worry about making a name for yourself. If you're a Christian, you've already got the greatest name in the world. Christian. Christ follower. Child of God. You can cry out to him, Abba, Daddy, Father. It doesn't get any better than that. Reject pride because it, it's a plague. And be humble. If God wants you to be famous, he can take care of that. But don't seek fame. Seek God. And lastly, be a blessing. Be a blessing. The worst kind, you ever watch the program Hoarders? I, I, I can't. I just... I'll, I'll watch uh, American Pickers, but I, I can't watch Hoarders. It just drives me crazy. Um, but the worst kind of hoarder are the people who hoard blessings. You ever thought of that? The worst kind of hoarders are the people or, who hoard blessings. Pass them on. I will be a blessing. Think that, will you? I will be a blessing. I am blessed to be a blessing. Worship team, come on and lead us in a song. And communion stewards, if you would come up as well. We're going to have to clear a couple seats up here in the front, uh, front center, so that the uh, elders have a place to sit. And uh, we will serve communion.
you can be seated. Jesus said, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. Lord Jesus, um, help us to do just that. Remove a critical spirit from our lips and from our hearts. Remove hatred, malice, backbiting, pride, gossip, Spare us from having loose tongues. Help us when we gather into small groups. To not spend our time talking about how we don't like the way other people are doing things. Remove from us a critical spirit and pettiness. Help us to be people that are full of joy and humility and compassion and love. Help us to give our brothers and sisters the benefit of the doubt. Help us to act like your children, because that's who we are. Help us as we partake of these symbols that represent your broken body, Lord Jesus, and your blood. Help us come to a deeper understanding of what it means to sacrifice and to give and to trust God and to love others enough that we're willing to give ourselves so that they will come to you. Guide our thoughts as we partake of these sacred elements. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you know Jesus is your Savior, we invite you to uh, take a piece of bread, hold it until all are served, and we'll eat together.
Jesus said, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let's see. Jesus said, this is the New Testament of my blood. This do in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth my death until I come again. Let's drink. Amen. We're going to sing um, a song that goes along with the sermon, Make Me a Blessing. After that, we're going to receive a benevolent offering on the way out at the door. The uh, ushers will be holding a plate, and if you'd like to give something uh, towards that, and I think you'll have a basket there for folks to throw their cups into so that we don't have to collect them during the service. But I want you to, are you tired today? I get the feeling people are tired today. It's just kind of, just kind of. You gotta stand and you gotta get into this last song. I realize it goes a little bit high on the uh, on the chorus, but just get it up there, okay? Come on, let's sing.
idea on that last phrase. You're doing fairly well, but on that last make me a blessing, if you just kind of step up on your tippy toes, it might help you get up there. Either that or you could sing in an octave lower, okay? But let's belt it out, all right? Let's make ourselves a blessing. Let's go to the next verse. We need the next. You have asked to us. next to you. Tell them, my, you're good looking. <laughs> 